So Nibs, you've been involved in the music industry for many years now, 14 years I think. I think you had your first show, I remember you telling me, in 1984? Yeah, around about then. I had, I'd had played actually a few shows before that. Okay. But uh, pretty much like school talent contests and, okay. but mainly the first gigs were 86, 87. Um, I'd done my army service, no it was before army. Um, I was I was messing around. I was playing uh, in and around Benoni at a few uh, where I come from at a few little restaurants and that, just doing more of the folk things. But at the same time, I was um, experimenting with my own compositions. And between playing favorite songs of mine at the time, I was incorporating a lot of my own tunes. Great. So how did you get involved in the, in the music scene in South Africa? Um, I know you started in Durban, I think. Mm. Okay. I mean, it's. Pretty much, it's, it, it was always like a, it was inevitable to be that um, from the age of 14 that I wanted to pursue a, a, a career in music. Um, I just knew it, 14 years old, I'd made my mind up that that was going to be my career choice. My father was an airline pilot, so as every young boy has it, I had dreams and aspirations of being an airline pilot, so until the music bug really got me deep in the groove uh, at the age of 14, that I, that I knew I was going to do for the rest of my life. So Nibs, we, we always know you about uh, as being a, a walking musical dictionary encyclopedia and knowing a lot about all the artists and, and bands from right across the board from jazz to rock to classical. So who were the early musicians or composers who inspired your writing and your playing? I grew up in a, a family environment where music was very much a staple in the household. My mother being a classical pianist, um, music was always a staple in the house. Mm. And I was just used to sit hours next to my mom while she played like her favorite classical repertoire, which always had a profound impact as a young boy. Okay, and besides my mother's influences, um, my father grew, was very much into his big band stuff. Glenn Miller, Artie Short, Jimmy Dorsey, Tommy Dorsey. Um, and that big popular big band repertoire of the day uh, was very much part of the household as well. Not to say I was as attracted to it as maybe my mother's classical repertoire, but it did have a place, it did hold a place there. But the biggest influence for me was sharing a room with my older brother. He's seven years older than me. And uh, there was always a staple of Beatles, Stones in the house. And I used to go to bed listening to the Beatles or the Stones. And two benchmark albums for me, which had to change my life forever, was um, Beatles for Sale, was the fourth Beatles album. And um, I mean, just every song was a gem. And from the first song, No Reply, to uh, the last song, Everyone, Everybody Wants to Be My Baby, it was just f first to the last song, it had such a profound impact on me. And uh, ironically enough, I bought it on CD the other day. And when my sister was out from England, her nephew, or her son, my nephew, Luca, the minute he heard that Babies in Black, the third track on the album, he couldn't get enough of it. And I'm just thinking, wow, well, this, this album had such a profound impact on me, and it's affecting someone the same age, the way that, to me, all those years ago, actually, when he left to go back to England, I actually gave him the copy. He, it's, and my sister says he knows the word to, to every song of that album. Really? And the second album is... Beatles, I mean the Stones aftermath, it's, um, mm. every song in that album too was just had a profound impact on me, Lady Jane, Under My Thumb, Out of Time, so Beatles and the Stones for sure, of the early influences. Mm. And with your mum being a classical pianist, how did you manage to 
acquire a guitar and, and, and play guitar as, a, as your choice of instrument? My, my father played guitar. Um, okay. He pl played in the war and before the war. He knew four chords, but he played them really well. <laughs> played harmonica and uh, also what, ukulele. ukulele as well. Okay, you know better than I do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, uh, there was always a guitar in the household. So, the irony of the story, all my sisters went to classical music lessons. My mother sent them to piano lessons and I didn't feel the need to go. But my mother's influences were so profound and huge that um, I think just the whole classical temperament and uh, sound I was hearing is very much what I expressed when I started writing my own songs and that. I picked the guitar up at the age of 14. Um, I got serious with the guitar at age 14. My brother had been going to lessons and he had um, like a Beatles songbook of the best, best of the Beatles. It was called the Lennon and McCartney songbook and that's where I picked up songs like um, Paperback Writer. You know, I asked you for the chords the other day. Uh, it's, it's, it's got chords. one chord, eh? One chord. Okay, I, I was battling to hear the changes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, all Beatles songs I really love. Just it's, I practice playing the chord changes from Beatles songs, and my brother do you, also. Do you remember how to play any of them? Uh, one to mind, I guess, <laughs> which I picked up was well, Eleanor Rigby because uh, Eleanor Rigby was the first one I got. Strings, yeah. So I remember that had two chords. That was E minor to C, I think. I get all okay. I've got a frog in my throat this early hour of the morning, mm -hmm. so I'm not going to sing. But it was E, e minor to C. Mm -hmm. So that was the first, and obviously some of the Be other Beatles song was um, Stuck to Man. Norwegian wood. Yeah. Oh, I, I learned so many. So many. And I haven't really played them much recent, yeah. you know? Sure. And, and more about your, your career, Nibs, like more about how you got into music. I mean, uh, um, as, a, as a career, like becoming active as a serious musician in the, in the industry or the scene around South Africa. Okay, well, it, it always started out that. Um, from an early age, although I learned Beatles songs, Stone songs, I started writing my own songs at the age of 14, mm. you know, and kind of being proud of songs I was writing then. And um, ironically, I still play a lot of my early repertoire songs I'd written in my teens. I still have them in my repertoire today. Mm. But uh, I guess after I finished, I did two years national service for my country. Thereafter, I went um, down to Durban. I studied at Natal Technicon. Um, and while I was studying there, I, I started to put an ensemble together. I had a little ensemble called Little Nomads, which was just a three piece band mm. playing more instrumental compositions. Your own compositions? Yeah, my own compositions. Um, instrumental pieces I'd written at the time. Okay. And uh, one of them, which I played then, I remember. It was on my first first landscape prayers album, guys. Guys. Something like that, I haven't played these for years actually. So I had that kind of African feel, okay. I suppose with cliches of maybe classical harmony somewhere in between. Sure. And so it was a mixture and um, I had little nomads for about two years while I was a student. It was a student band and we played a whole bunch of gigs in the Durban area. But at the same time I was doing a lot of folk club gigs as well, like in 1990, uh, 1989 and at uh, Durban Folk Club was very active at the time and it was always a fantastic stage for new singer-songwriters sure. to uh, express themselves. So that was a start and I remember my first folk club gig, I, I got a nice response and I thought, oh, okay, 
<laughs> this is good. So I, I actually started uh, playing more, uh, playing more at folk clubs. It, and that was a real springboard for getting serious about um, wanting to play my stuff out there. Sure. Then I was involved in 89, from 90, 89 to 93 with a, a trio called Plagal Cadence, which was uh, very much um, three acoustic guitars. There's one critic cited it was like uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash on speed. It was, we, were, we had fun, we played great songs and we did like all the technical three-part harmony guitar stuff in between all of that. So it was a real fun gig and we had a really nice cult following in KwaZulu Natal, mm. playing a lot of the festivals. Okay. Then I mean that instrumental ensemble thing always was, was, a, was something I really wanted to do. And um, I guess I was listening a lot to more progressive music at the time and one band in particular which sticks out in my mind was, is the Dixie Dregs. Mm. Uh, an ensemble from the University of Miami and they had six albums out. Their principal guitarist Steve Morse, I've told you many times about, mm. it's a big influence. Just the way he wrote, jumping from one style to the next in an instrumental ensemble. And I suppose that's got, him, got me excited about forming landscape prayers and um, with the inclusion of a, a violinist um, in the same vein the Dixie Dregs had and other bands are listening to Kansas. And the violin kind of became the, the, the human voice which was missing from the lyrics. So that's why when I compose a lot of the songs, even now, if I'm writing it for a different instrument, and I, my preferred instrument is always violin, I kind of sing the melody line out, so sure. a lot of the, I was doing all, well 90% of the writing for the band and I was writing out the violin lines, uh, singing them out and the violinist was actually playing, the, playing my vocal lines I was singing. So it had real natural phrases and natural breaks, yeah. like that. Yeah. Tell us about your time with Landscape Press. Okay, the band started in 92. Mm -hmm. It went through various lineup changes. Um, first album was recorded with another bassist and drummer. And then uh, for three albums after that, we had a, a new bassist and drummer and had uh, the, the violinist remained, uh, Ant, Cawthorn Blazerby, mm -hmm. and uh, very much a field player. Um, had real soul uh, when he played, so that was a real plus because being caught in instrumental bands, being frenetic, people often said, oh, it's yeah. <laughs> you, need, you needed that balance, and he was a real uh, soulful figure in the band. So the band, I mean, our first album was recorded in 94. We, we were booked time at the University of Natal in the studio there. We um, recorded the first album on a shoestring budget. I think we spent a thousand rand on the first album. And then uh, we started touring the country, playing, playing around the country, then released uh, two albums after that. My favorite of the Landscape Press album is an album we did in 97 called Transmigration Man. And I always felt it wasn't pushed enough. We could have had more reviews or whatever, whatever. Um, that was like the freshest album and it, it, I kind of it epitomizes what the band was of that, mm. was that time. But uh, I mean, the band was my vision. I started it out, and uh, who knows when the time is right for me to pick up the pieces again. I've got I, I score most of the stuff, and uh, mm. we'll start pick it up where we left off. Great. The moment I'm enjoying the solo solo side of things, and uh, the more intimate thing. And it was always a criticism of a lot of people out there that always said, "Wow, luck." I often used to play landscape prayer stuff solo acoustically and often had the comment that your, your playing gets lost in the mix, your little details and intricacies and little nuances often get lost when you've got a full band playing. Uh, often a full band kind of overshadows your, sure. what you're trying to do. So people saying it more and more to me during the time of the band, while the band was in its that present, in, not wasn't present, in that form was still going. I always had an outlet for my solo stuff. I was, um, had two solo albums out, my first one being Lines in My Face, which came out in 99. And I was kind of playing material which maybe didn't fit in with the band. Maybe it was too finger style or too, too acoustic for a band setting. Um, and the reviews were really favorable and always good. Mm. Also, a second album, Fly in the Rain, came out in 2002. 
more and more people started saying to me, come, you need to play more solo. We, mm. So th that was always in the back of my mind all the time. And I wasn't doing it. I released the albums and it was always band, band, band. And mm. never had, never really gave myself a time for, to do my own thing. Sure. It was like band obsession, living for the band. Even though I was very proactive as a soloist, but not really going out there as a recording yeah. soloist. Sure. So... I'm feeling that now and I'm really enjoying doing so gigs. I'm really enjoying doing some gigs with you. I'm loving it, you know. It's like you can really f express yourself, free yourself up and Absolutely. have fun with music, which maybe was missing for a long time. Um, and uh, that's what I love playing with Gito as well. He was a fun person to be with. Kind of no egos involved. You're playing music because for music's sake and you, you're just enjoying the music for, for music's sake and just loving it. And uh, that's what I'm really loving now at the moment as a, as a solo artist and playing with friends who share the same philo philosophies and same head, same headspace. So Nibs, tell us how you met Jito. I remember you telling me a story back in 1988, I believe. Yeah, the first time I wouldn't say met Jito, but saw Jito play was um, in 1988, it was at the University of Durban Westville. Uh, there was a lunchtime concert. I'd, I'd read a review about this trio which just formed in Johannesburg called T Tananas. And I read a re review about the guitarist Steve Newman who had put a, a trio together. And I remember seeing Steve Newman, the guitarist, in, on, on shows on TV like in the late 70s, early 80s thinking, wow, what a fantastic guitarist, it's being, being able to play Brazilian rhythms and uh, a whole array of acoustic styles, but what really struck, struck out was he had a really strong African element in his playing, which really st struck the chord in my heart, you know, that wow. And when I, I, mem I remembered the name and I thought, oh, that, that's going to be amazing. So about a week after I read, the, it was like a, one of these university magazines which had a review on Tananas. I think they had just reviewed, re released their first album. And uh, as fate has it, a week later I read in the paper, well, that Tananas are playing in the University of uh, Durban Westville on the cafeteria floor. Mm. So I went there and it was amazing. Uh, when I got there we thought we, was, we were late but they were playing pool and the sound equipment hadn't arrived yet. And the place was packed and after the quickest sound check I've ever witnessed and mm -hmm. them within five minutes plugging and getting a, a sound level, they, they, they rocked the little cafeteria for an hour and it changed my life forever. There was just such a synergy about the band and I always keep on telling people now who have only been introduced to Tananas in recent years that Tananas in the late 80s were the most unstoppable band I've ever seen. They had a chemistry which was very spiritual, it was of the political time, and songs and uh, a sound which was just so fantastic. And uh, anyways, um, I, I became a Tananas junkie, got to see them many, many times, and through the gigs met all the members, and actually the last person I really got to meet was Jito. And when we signed to Sheer Sound, Sheer Sound label in 95, Jito came in as our producer for the band mm. and well before that I'd actually opened at his uh, CD launch uh, with uh, some members of the Landscape Press. We opened his CD launch for his Akaya album yeah. and that's where we really became friends and then a year later he came down to Durban in 96 to produce our album which Te Telegraph and we became really good friends and the first song we wrote together was Mountain Wind which was an instrumental I had and he laid Shangai lyrics to it and it became our benchmark for getting, doing gigs together with him doing vocals, him playing a nylon string guitar and um, bass. So in 2000 we started gigging together, which is great. Playing his tunes, my tunes, having fun gigs together the way I'm having fun gigs with you. Absolutely. When our respective projects weren't working, just having fun there and with the music. And we loved playing as a duo together and eventually we decided to record an album together which became the Sweet Thorn album mm. and um, it was all the songs we had been playing live and it was just such a divine moment. I remember going to his house uh, recording the album over two sessions and 
just having a real presence of the divine. It was such a powerful, powerful two days recording with him. Unforgettable. And when he died, we always put it on hold, the album. I was thinking at the time, maybe we were looking for a better record deal, someone, because we really believe in the product. Sure. And in April this year, 2004, April 4th exactly, it was a Saturday, Saturday morning, I was at Gito's house, because I live in Durban, Gito lives in Joburg, went to Gito's house, rehearsed the songs, and he, is, he said, hey, it's time to get the album out. Sure. So we planned to release it, planned strategy for it, and we're going to actually play it here in Maputo the, at the end of April, get it released. And might as well, because Gita comes from Mozambique, get the album out in Mozambique, launch it here, mm. and then to the rest of the country. And he died that night. And we had the most amazing gig together. A gig I'll never forget. And it was almost like kind of God's hand was always on it. The, the release of the album, my time with Gita, God's hand was definitely on it. It was just a very powerful, powerful experience. What an incredible human being, incredible musician. We always keep telling people he's just such a, a voiceless voice because so many guys get recognition who have got half the talent of Gito had and half the identity Gito has. But Gito was just a true, true musician, true, such a unique voice vocally and on, the, on his instrument that I just pray and I believe in the years to come, Gito's legacy is just going to go through the years. And I think that's what we're doing now. We're in here in Maputo doing these benefit shows for him and mm. just furthering his legacy. Absolutely. Death always comes, comes unexpected, especially when you're an artist. And most artistic figures, they live for the moment, they live for the day. And sometimes we live through life not going through the same procedures as normal 95 business people go. And uh, that's what I love about Gita, that's what I love about being an artist and playing music with you. But it's been such a rewarding time being in Maputo here, doing these benefit shows for Gita. He was such a breadwinner for his family here in Mozambique. Loved his family in Mozambique. At, from South Africa every month he was helping them out financially. and. Besides keeping the legacy of his music going, uh, just our, our benefit concerts here for his family, is, uh, it's, it's been such a rewarding experience. Mm. And having his whole tour documented, this whole long weekend doc documented for history, you know, it's, for us it's, uh, it's also God's got his hand on it and it's, it's just such a, been such a rewarding thing, meeting people who are so close to Gita and them expressing their, their love for him. And, uh, how this country actually loved him and embraced him. And that's why I've got a passion for Maputo and I've passion for Mozambique and it's because of Gito. I just, uh, he got me excited about this country long before I ever came here because of the war. We weren't, we, we couldn't get, we couldn't come through at the time. But I'm going to always come here and I'm, this is almost like a second home because Gito is like a spirit in the wind which I'll always come back here and I'll always have that a strong, strong feeling in my soul and a remembrance and love for Gito for being here. Mm. Well, I mean, as you know, uh, Africa Bar started playing there in the, about four years ago when it first opened with Landscape Press. We did a whole bunch of gigs. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, and it's fun, it's awesome to be playing these tribute gigs at the same venue with you. Funny enough, at once Gito was in Maputo at the time and he came and actually sang with us at the Africa Bar as well. Oh, really? And his brother was there as well. Okay. We sang Nakaranza. Title track of his second album, and what's been cool is just to I remember the other night when we were playing his song of "Sad Melody." Mm. I just saw his brother sitting in the audience, and how it actually just the emotion. Everyone was overwhelmed with emotion. The table in front of us, uh, just when yeah, we played the first night, they knew the song, and uh, they were transported. And mm. so we just jammed it a bit. Yeah. I, just, I love I love playing it, you know. And this song "Sad Melody" was written. Uh, when Gito's dad, dad died four years ago, he was very close to his father. Uh, he wrote the song for his father. So whenever we play it live, it's, it's always like we giving it back to the family, back to Gito's sure. memories as a beautiful singer-songwriter. Should we play like a, a verse, a chorus, and end? It's called Sad Melody.
Beautiful. I just, I love playing a song. Great tune. Every time I play Great it, tune. it brings too many memories. Mm. Tell us about the rest of your the projects and recordings that you've been involved in. I know this, you've just finished recording your eighth CD, not necessarily as a solo album, but with various projects and bands that you've been involved in throughout the years. Tell us. Well, this year has been a good year. We released Sweet Thorn with Jita after he died. And then uh, another album I was released this year was a side project, which goes under the title of Hardy Doll, which, was with, which is with Barry Fonsell, who's the drummer with Johnny Clegg's band. And it was kind of co-written compositions, Barry writing all these exotic rhythms and me having to compose tunes over them. And we got some radical guest artists to come and put their stamp on every song. We had Sean Phillips, um, a Texan folky singer-songwriter. We played, wrote beautiful lyrics and sang on greatly on one, of, one instrumental we had. And Concord Inkabinda, who's with Johnny Clegg's band as well. Uh, jazz avant-garde bassist Carla Mombelli and Naomi Younger from Black Sunshine. So that was a real fun project to do and mm. got a whole bunch of gigs lined up when he's not on tour with, uh, with Johnny. And as we speak now, um, I'm in the mixing process of my new album called Beautiful Feet. It's going to be released with yours uh, early next year, uh, which is really exciting on uh, the independent label Greenhouse Records, which is uh, kind of got the freedom to express yourself to the max. Mm. And uh, Beautiful Feet's kind of like a, there's a passage, and I'm terrible with quoting the exact places in the Bible, but on many scriptures there's, because feet aren't really beautiful. People are, I don't know if you come to think about it physically, but uh, there's a, quotes in the Bible which says how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news and I guess it's prophetically speaking maybe had some prophecy over my life and just the way I'm feeling now I love to travel and I just think I um, love to play music with my friends playing abroad and different countries and I think it's kind of synonymous synonymous of those beautiful feet we're going into different territories and playing music and without getting super religious about it, letting God's presence and God's power through the music affect people around you. So that's like the message of the beautiful feet. So that whole album's like a, a travelogue of a pilgrimage kind of rooted in the west, east coast of Africa. I love Mozambique and I've, I've been really enjoying a lot of music from different parts of Africa. So in this album, it's um, kind of what I do, like acoustic album, more vocals and uh, I've got Guru here playing on <laughs> how many tunes? Six, seven songs. Six seven, yeah. And I'm really excited about this song where you laid sitar down mm. called Dreams of Believers. It really gives music. that like Eastern, but also like almost East African feel. Like almost sure. the phrasing's quite got that almost when you think of a Zanzibar market or something like that. So I'm I'm really excited about it. This, this tune, it's gone through many name titles. I, I wrote it for my dear friend, uh, Kabos van der Westhuizen's wedding. Mm. So this tune is called Zerus to Zion. Okay. Goes something like that. I'll just play a snippet of it. Like 30 seconds or at least. Cool, man. This is very really simple. I've gone for simple songs and whatever feels good. Sure. I know you've been saying like you've been listening to, you've come back to simplicity more in, in your writing and you're listening to music. Absolutely. The Beatles and... Man, do you know what? 
got to realize how influential the Beatles were in my life. I'll speak a little bit of my influences I haven't, who I didn't mention earlier as well, but my mother for my birthday this year bought me the five DVD sets of the Beatles. And <laughs> 12 hours. my mother sat 12 <laughs> hours with me watching them with me. It's got to really, I realize the genius of it all. And uh, in fact, my, mo <laughs> my mother was more into watching it than I was. And it, it really changed my life all over again. I just wanted to, I just thought how fresh it, it's fresh it sounds after listening to it so many times as a youngster. So yeah, I'm going back to wanting to just write songs and if you have to express yourself musically, do it, but except maybe not trying to really prove yourself, trying to tell, say everything you want to within 30 seconds of music. And then you're not really saying anything at all. Sure. And um, just other early influences in my life as a, as a musician. I loved a southern rock band called the Orman Brothers Band. And their guitarist, Dwayne Orman, he was killed at a young age in a motorbike accident. It's a very instrumental figure in my life as really being a serious musician as well. Just his feel, his solos, his lifestyle. I mean, not his lifestyle, he's quite wild. <laughs> but uh, just being a musician, a bluesman, basically. True bluesman. That's attracting me more and more. I'm listening to more of them now. I'm just thinking they're living the moment with each gig. And I listen to the offshoots of the Almonds now, like Government Mule, and they're just hungry to play music, and every night's going to be different. And then they're spreading like a, a message through the music of just being honest, of music, of, uh, a spirit of honesty, which mm. I've been getting so into of late. And I, I mean, I love the singer song as we can talk hours on Nick Drake, all those lost Tim Buckley. Tim Buckley, Michael Hedges, mm. who, who's been your biggest influence, but you got to hear him from the two albums I had, you know? Sure. First, so, I mean, the list goes on. We could have another interview just speaking about our influences, <laughs> carrying on like that. Sure. So, Nibs, tell us about uh, future plans, the road ahead for you as, as your solo artist and the various projects you're involved in and bands that you might have in your head, potentially in your mind. Well, at the moment, I'm just loving playing with you, mm -hmm. doing solo. And the beauty of our gig together is we, we both soloists in our own right, got our own albums out, but we get the opportunity to play our songs and play some cool duets together. So my road ahead is a, a fantastic. Okay, we're now December 2004. My road is at the release of our new albums, touring them together abroad, far afield, coming back to beautiful Maputo again. Man, it's been the most awesome three days here. Had people from friends come and join us and Never been to the city before and I've loved it, eh? the nightlife. I mean, just sitting at Costa de Sol yesterday, drinking that ice cold beer and eating those prawns. Life doesn't get better than that. Eh? It's just, yeah, it's those life experiences which uh, get translated into the music. Thanks, man. Thank you. <laughs> Shut up, bro. Thanks, brother. Mm. Good stuff. <laughs>